Now, in many ways, Brown's uh, background was similar to that of many other abolitionists, particularly in the strength of religion in his upbringing and his outlook. Brown was born in 1800 in the city of Torrington, Connecticut. Anyone here ever been in Torrington, Connecticut? You, yeah, all right, a couple of people. Not much is happening in Torrington, but anyway, um, it's up. It's on the Naugatuck River at the top of what they call the Brass Valley, where, which used to be a major industrial region of the United States. All these industrial towns, but like, like after deindustrialization, it's nothing personal, but it's kind of kaput. Um, it's an interesting place to visit. The post office has a wonderful set of murals from the 1930s, WPA murals of the life of John Brown. And it's, it's well worth uh, taking a look at them. And um, John Brown's birthplace is there. And um, if you enter the town, when you come in off Route 8, you, there's a big welcome sign, which seems awfully incongruous in a way to me. Anyway, it's, it, there's all these little uh, you know, insignias of you know, the odd fellows and the Kiwanis and these groups. And then at the bottom is, welcome, birthplace of John Brown. Those groups don't seem to be the John Brown type. But anyway. Um, but here's an article from the New York Times not long ago. Torrington needs tourism. So there was an effort to, uh, let me put it this way, Torrington is ambivalent about its heritage relating to John Brown. The local municipal historian, Ernest Cedar, says that he has been trying to make John Brown's birthplace into a, a kind of a play, a little museum, you know, a place to indicate the life of John Brown. But uh, it hasn't gotten anywhere. Some residents, this is unbelievable, New York Times, Torrington, Connecticut. Some residents have told him they don't want Torrington attracting black visitors. This is not Mississippi. This is Torrington, Connecticut. And believe me, they could use every dollar they can get, no matter what color, as long as it's green. Um, <laughs> the mayor takes a kind of neutral stance. She said, a lot of difference of opinion here as to whether he was a true abolitionist or just a rabble rouser. How you would know that, I don't know. But um, anyway, then the other guy says, well, look, Torrington has lost its tax base, and we need a tourist attraction. Well, nothing has happened yet, as far as I'm aware, but maybe they'll have a John Brown Museum one of these days. Um, anyway, as I say, John Brown, now John Brown, maybe part of the problem is he only lived in Torrington for about a year or something, and then his family moved out to Ohio. So his connection with Torrington is a little remote. But anyway, Brown, as I say, deeply religious, like many abolitionists, but his religion was different. <laughs> Most abolitionists came out of the revival, the, the Second Great Awakening, as they call it, the evangelical revivals of the 1820s, 30s, 40s, their religion was a religion of optimism, of perfectionism, that you can change human nature, you can change society. Um, it's the religion of the New Testament, of Jesus as a kind of personal savior to people and a way of improving the world. Brown is an Old Testament guy, an eye for an eye. He, and the Old Testament, as you know, I'm sure, is a rather violent document. Um, and his, he was the vengeful God of the Old Testament that appealed to Brown, not the forgiving Jesus Christ of the New Testament. And he saw his war, his personal war against slavery in this biblical light, that he had a divine mission to fight the institution of slavery and to aid the oppressed in a more general sort of way. As I say, he believes in original sin, he be, he's pessimistic about He's not this New Testament evangelical optimism. Um, vengeance, not conversion, is what, he's, what appeals to him, perhaps. Um, but he's also much more attuned to black abolitionists' thinking than many of the other white abolitionists. Because black abolitionists, by and large, I don't want to generalize completely, but by and large, it did not get into the factional fighting that seemed to consume a lot of white abolitionists about whether you should go into politics or not, whether you should use moral suasion. Black abolitionists basically, with, although I'm using a phrase from Malcolm X a hundred years later, basically believed any means necessary. 
Whatever you can do to attack slavery is fine with us. They didn't take an ideological stance about this method or that method being the only proper one. And so they were open to Brown, even though he rejected this moral suasion uh, notion. Now, Brown um, has little in common with Abraham Lincoln, except in a kind of obverse sort of way. Lincoln, as I said last time, is a guy who rises with the market revolution and embraces the market revolution and tries to spread the market revolution as a mode of you know, success for people in northern society. Brown is a guy who sinks beneath the waves of the market revolution. And there were many like him. Not everybody in America was rags to riches or rags to success like Lincoln. There were a lot of people who went, uh, there's been, I don't know why, maybe it's because the economic situation we've been in since 2008, but lately there have been a lot more books being published by historians about failure in American history, failure, debt, bankruptcy. But there was a lot of that too in this era. And uh, whether Brown or Lincoln was more typical is hard to say. But certainly Brown, he, he became a farmer uh, out in Ohio. He raised wool, he sold wool, um, built a tannery, but he seemed to always fail. Uh, he, he went into debt, he, he, he engaged in some complicated and not totally up above board economic transactions, but he, he was always in debt for most of his life, Brown. He was not one of these guys who seized the opportunity successfully of the market revolution. And again, uh, there's a lot of people like him in Northern society as well as the ones who succeeded. Um, personally, he was a pretty, well, he's pretty intense. What can I say? He, uh, he was intolerant of weaknesses in others. He was self-important. If you believe you have a divine mission, you tend to get self-important. He was not the kind of guy you want to have for dinner, let's put it that way. Um, and he certainly, uh, his um, theory of upbringing, by the way, he had 20 children. He had his two wives, 20 children, so that's quite a few. And his, um, his theory of child raising was basically spare the rod and spoil the child. In other words, his belief in violence was within the family as well as uh, outside of it. Um, but Brown devoted his life from the 1840s to trying to fight slavery. And in 1847, he and Frederick Douglass had a meeting. This we get from Douglass's autobiography, which may or may not be 100% true, like all autobiographies. But what Douglass says is in 1847, Brown unfolded a plan to him. The plan was to establish a kind of fortress, a base, in the Appalachian Mountains, in Virginia, Western Virginia, and with armed men, of course, and to have forays down into the plantation area. Bands would go down, they'd run slaves off, they'd rescue them, they would uh, cause pro they, they would conduct a kind of guerrilla operation against slavery, and if the army came after them or the militia, they would fight them in that way, and the result would be to destabilize the institution of slavery. Slaves would start running away uh, when they understood that the sort of power structure was being weakened. Um, the value of slave property would collapse in Virginia, and um, then they would move further south down the Appalachian mountain chain, and... Um, this was Brown's idea at this time, a kind of guerrilla war against slavery. Um, and he read about previous such campaigns in history, Roman, the, the, the tribes, the so-called barbarian tribes that fought against ancient Rome, or um, the French, Toussaint L'Ouverture, how he fought and defeated the great armies of Napoleon. Uh, or Garibaldi's operations in Italy in the 1850s. So he was thinking about that kind of warfare. Um, he also, what, even though he didn't have a lot of money, he helped, to he helped to fund the publication of radical black abolitionist literature. Henry Highland Garnett, a black abolitionist and a fugitive slave, who eventually later became a, a minister, Presbyterian minister here in New York City, Garnett in 1843 had given a fiery speech at an African-American convention in calling on the slaves to rebel, calling on the slaves to rise up and overthrow the system of slavery. This was so, so much against the general Garrisonian principles that the convention, which had a lot of Garrisonians, uh, refused to include it. They published proceedings of the 
convention, but they refused to include Garnett's speech as being too violent. A few years later, Brown personally paid for the publication of a pamphlet which included Garnett's speech calling for a slave revolution and David Walker's great appeal from 1829, which was maybe the beginning of the radical abolitionist movement. So Brown was, you know, he's interested in spreading these ideas. And then in 1851, he gets involved in trying to fight against the fugitive slave law. So this is, this is his modus operandi. Uh, 